We're going to get back on track to our series, uh, Keys of the Kingdom. So we're just going through some basic kingdom principles to kind of remind us of the basics. Sometimes it's easy, or it's, uh, it's important to keep things simple, um, to remember the foundation upon which we build. It's Jesus, obviously. Everything's about Jesus. I only have like one message, it's Jesus. It's got about 60 points. But Jesus is all that matters. So uh, if you want to follow along, here's something to pass and take. Uh, I encourage you actually today to take notes. I think today would be a good one. To, if you don't, if you're not a note taker, that's fine. But if you're a note taker, I would definitely take notes today. I think it's really important. Um, it'll give you something to kind of ponder this week. So as those things are going around, I just want to uh, mention something. Um, as a church, I think it's, the Lord just reminded me recently again, um, just kind of came up, and I feel like it came up for a reason, that we need to, as a, as a church, as a community of people, be very um, diligent to fight to preserve unity. To fight to preserve uh, relationships, and just know one, one of the first places that churches often get attacked when the Lord is moving is within each other, among each other. So fight against the critical spirit, fight against um, bitterness and unforgiveness, which we're going to talk about today. It's a fun one. Um, fight against gossip. Um, and also, I, I want to encourage everyone to, um, you know, at, at no point in time have we as a community ever said that we are about anything, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We don't settle as a community for the status quo. Okay? And what that means is, you know, Scripture talks about living a life above reproach. Living a life where people could have, it would have to be a false accusation for people to make accusation about you wrongly. Don't give people any place or room to say, oh, well, look at those Christians. Licentiousness has played a part, a role in the church in America for too long. And someone, somewhere, a community of people has to stand up and say, we're not okay with that. We're not okay with plain church. We're not okay with mixing the world with the church. And I'm not talking about not going into the world. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there should look, something about us should look different than the world. We need to look different. We are people of light. Light and dark don't mix. And we should be bringing light into dark situations. Um, I know in the past, um, I've been, and, and I'll just say this, like I've been in seasons where, like maybe six years ago or so, where the Lord just was crushing me personally. Um, I had no ambition of my own. And it was a really good place to be in. It was, it was the most humble place that I've ever been in, the most broken I've ever been in. And some would say, well, who wants that? You want that. Um, and in those times, there were just a handful of times where I was accused of something that was completely outlandish. But, by God's grace in those moments, I internalized and said, what is it in me that would even think, make them think that that would be even a possibility? There must be something in me 
Why am I not the person that they would, someone would hear something and say, no, not him. There's got to be something in me. Now, I'm not talking about like navel gazing and, you know, being woe is me. But I am talking about checking yourself daily, your heart. Because this, is, this isn't an outward show that we put on. This is a relationship that we walk out every day. And if we're not doing that, we've, we've completely missed the point. And as we walk this relationship out with the Lord, He's super concerned about even the thoughts that we have. And we'll, we'll get into that even today a little bit. But it's not enough just to, well, I just don't do bad things. Well, you can try that for a while and see how it works. You know, a lot of times we maybe do Christian things on the outside, but there's hell going on inside. And, you know, it's pretty clear in Scripture that Jesus took the law and he said, well, it's not just about not doing those things. It's about what's in your heart. Have you even had the thought? So Jesus made the standard harder, not easier. So we're not a people that says, oh, you know, grace covers it. Do whatever you want. That's not really what Scripture says. There's mercy and love and acceptance and forgiveness for anything that you've done and there's also a standard of walking with him, getting rid of all that, and looking different. Jesus said, be perfect, because I'm perfect. How many of you are there? Not me. So at some point, as a community, we need to do the first thing, which is love one another. The first thing after loving him, obviously. The first thing that is a witness to who we are as, as Christians. Um, so I, enough of the lecture, but I just wanted to bring that back up because um, I, I really feel like we need a reminder of those things because they're important. They're, they're little things, but they're big things. So um, be prepared for provoking That's all I'm going to say about that. All right. So I need seven volunteers here in a second. Does anyone want to volunteer? You don't know what you're volunteering for. Okay, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Did I see seven? Was that a hand? No, I'm scratching. Oh, scratching. <laughs> you're seven? Okay. So we got seven. So if, if I called you, you're coming up here in a second. So we're going to talk about forgiveness today. Um, it's a key of the kingdom. It's a principle. It's a law. It's a very foundational element. And it's very um, compromised often. So we're going to talk about it in terms of what that means for us as Christians. Um, hopefully in a way that we can understand how to apply that in our life because it's really, really important. And it's easy to play the justification game of why we shouldn't. Well, you don't know what they did to me. You, ever, you heard that one? Maybe internally you've heard it. Well, if you want what you get, what you deserve, we go to hell. So it's not about that. If we get what we deserve, we go to hell. And I don't mean to say it so bluntly, but it's true. So at some point, number one, this is a strong point of our witness as Christians. It's not a natural thing to forgive people for something that they actually did wrong to you. So let's see, we're going to start with, with some scripture. So if you're one of the seven, come up here. The lucky seven. Bring your Bible. I forgot to mention that part. So you guys are going to read some scriptures. So the first one, whoever's number one, has Mark 11, verse 25. The second person has Matthew 6. 
14 through 15. The third person has Ephesians 4. I don't know a number either. Oh, okay. You're supposed to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Three, four. We good? Okay. So, three, Ephesians 4, verse 32. Four is Matthew 18, 21. Five is Luke 6, verse 27. The next one is Luke 6, verse 37. And the next one is Matthew 5, verse 21 through 24. Number one. I, I think I am. <laughs> and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Okay. Good number two. Who's number two? Should have put you in the order. Yeah. Who's number two? Matthew six fourteen. Right. I'm number three. We don't have number two. How many people are up here? Maybe I guess I was. I looked up seven. I thought it was seven. I'm seven. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I got it. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Oh, by the way, listen to these scriptures. <clears throat> Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ forgive you. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him, as many as seven times? But I say to you who hear, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Do not judge others and, do, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others or it will all come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. All right, thank you. So, did you hear anything that says, well, I mean, forgiveness is good, but you know, it's kind of a choice. Forgiveness is very difficult, especially in, in situations where, I mean, you know, look, we, we, we've all come from different uh, journeys, walks of life. We've all had different things happen to us. And, you know, I think uh, when I started in ministry, I had one idea of what it was like for people to deal with things. And then after a couple years of being in ministry, I realized, oh my gosh, people go through horrific things I can't, can't even fathom. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not an easy thing, but we're going to walk through a couple things that I think will hopefully help us to understand how forgiveness works and start walking in that direction. So, um, before we get any further, let's just pray. Um, to see what the Lord's doing right now. So Father, we just come asking you for help. <clears throat> because we cannot do anything on our own. And God, I ask for you to lead this morning what you want spoken, spoken. What, where you want to go, where you want to, to head. Father, help us to see. I ask for clarity this morning. I ask for conviction this morning. I 
God, give us an equal dose of your grace and mercy and conviction. We don't want to wallow around in the mud. So I'm going to try and keep this condensed as much as possible. I mean, there's a lot of di different directions I can, could head this morning, but um, there's a couple things that I want to hit on for sure. And so I call this total forgiveness because forgiveness and total forgiveness, I think, are two different things. Total forgiveness, I believe, is two parts, and we're going to talk about those two parts. <coughs> So, I believe there are two aspects of forgiveness, and the first aspect of forgiveness is external forgiveness. What does that mean? So, let's think of this in terms of court, okay, because there is a legal reality to the spirit world, okay? When someone does something to you, you have something legal against them that you can bring to court. So if you owed someone money, or excuse me, someone owed you money, and you were in court, and you decide to stand up and tell the judge, look, judge, they owe me money, I'm not happy about it, they haven't paid me, but I'm gonna just decide right now, they don't owe me any money anymore, okay? And the judge says, are you sure? And you say, I'm not happy about it, but yes, I'm sure. And the judge uses his gavel. The judgment's made. The debt is forgiven them. Now you may walk out of that courtroom ticked off, full of bitterness, full of anger. That is not total forgiveness, but that is what I call external forgiveness. That is what I believe we are commanded to do. Because you, there's scripture that talks about when you retain the sins of, of someone, they are retained. When you forgive them, they are forgiven. There are some of the things that we walk in as Christians that I think we don't have a clue what kind of authority we've been given. We don't have, a, I mean, and I mean, I mean that for real. I have no idea sometimes what type of authority I'm supposed to be walking in. It's pretty weighty stuff. So we are commanded to use that authority to let people off the hook, to forgive them. And that is what I, what I believe is external forgiveness. And I've got a couple scriptures for you I'm going to go over. Matthew 7. Let me get Matthew instead of Mark. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. What was that scripture again? That's Matthew 7, verse 1 and 2. And let's look at James 4. Don't take my opinion for it. James 4, 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you who judge your neighbor? Ooh. Now, there is an issue of Christians judging sin, and that's for another day. But when it comes to personal offense and personal wrongs, we are to forgive, period. Now, that external forgiveness is a command, it's not a suggestion. But total forgiveness, and let me just preface by saying this, that external forgiveness is a step to total forgiveness. That's the first step. And it is not a feeling. It is a choice. Forgiveness is not saying what happened to me was okay. Forgiveness is saying it wasn't okay, but I forgive you anyway, because again, if I get what I deserve, thank God for Jesus for the cross. So we extend that same grace. 
So we have to move in a choice. The feeling hopefully comes later. And that's what I call internal forgiveness, the second part. Internal forgiveness or total forgiveness. And it, that is typically a journey. God can heal, he can deliver, he can instantaneously take any emotion, give it to you, take it from you. That is all possible. But from my experience, especially when you're dealing with pretty horrific abuse and things like that, total forgiveness is often a journey, but it is very possible. And those that do the diligent work of working through to that place have so much freedom, they give that away to other people. You walk in a level of authority that's not just for you, it's for others. So total forgiveness is a lifestyle. Again, it's, it's not that feeling, but that choice to bless and not curse. To pray for those that mistreat you. Now, I got convicted about this. Several years back, I had a coworker that was really difficult to work with. I prayed for that person multiple times a day because when something would come up in my heart, I would address it immediately. And that would happen sometimes every hour, sometimes a couple times an hour, depending on the day, the situation. And I was praying for the Lord to bless this person. And the Lord interrupted me one time and said, what if I actually do? And I was like, well, well, I don't know about that, but then why are you asking me to do it? And it challenged me to a whole other level of, we, we actually want good for our enemies. That's a whole other level. That is not of this world. When people see that, they see something that is unique, something that, is, that they have no comprehension for. That is our witness as Christians. So how soon should we forgive someone, and why? In my opinion, when I look at Scripture, we are to forgive immediately. And when I say immediately, I'm not suggesting that when someone gets raped, you drive over to their house, you get in their face, and demand that they forgive the person that did that. That would be inappropriate. But there is a place and a time, and when I say immediately, I don't, like I said, I don't mean like in the the face of the trauma. But there there needs to be an encouragement to do so. I, I have seen Christian uh, ministers encourage people not to forgive hastily because you wouldn't feel like you actually forgave them, so why do it anyway? In, until you feel like you could do it completely. I totally disagree with that. That's as abusive as the abuse that happened to you. That is relegating forgiveness to a feeling of, I've totally forgiven this person. I have no ill towards them whatsoever. Again, in my, when I read scripture, I see a command to forgive. That's not easy, but it's a commandment. We forgive them externally, then we join with the Lord in the process of forgiving them internally. I don't know who, who said this, but there's the, the saying, bitterness is the poison you drink hoping someone else will die. And that's what unforgiveness is. You know, we could actually go have a medical discussion. I'm not a doctor, but I've seen reports of doctors that suggest studies show that lots of diseases and affirmities come from unforgiveness. There are doctors that actually are teaching their patients how to forgive because of the physical result of forgiveness. Because there's something, there's bondage. Again, it's, it's a poison that we hold on to thinking they're the ones that are being punished and we're the ones being punished. They've probably long since forgotten about it. And we're daily tormented because we can't give it up. Now again, I'm not saying it's easy, but who said anything with the Lord is easy? You walk with Him long enough, you realize, oh man, this thing's hard. It's really, really simple. It's not complicated. It's really difficult. So another uh, point 
with that immediate forgiveness. We're not going to go into strongholds and, and all of what that is. But just suffice to say, immediately forgiving someone helps you avoid a stronghold developing in your life. When you start thinking in a certain way, you create a pattern that is very hard to break. Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can be transformed by the renewing of your mind in a good way, and you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind in a bad way. So if, if we allow offense to happen, and we don't forgive and enter into that process, we run the risk of developing our life around this stronghold, and it will skew everything. And again, strongholds are for another day, but just know Again, it's, it's us that get affected by it when we choose not to forgive. It's also an opportunity for us to grow in the spirit. The flesh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, wants you to hang on to that. The spirit would say, let it go. And we, we talked weeks back about the moment of choice and the tree, two trees and how we, you know, we get into a situation, something happens, we have this moment of choice, and by, based on what we decide and how we respond, we choose to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or from the tree of life. And that either feeds our flesh or it feeds our spirit. We either strengthen the flesh or we strengthen the spirit. This is yet another opportunity. Someone does something to you, Moment of choice. You either strengthen your spirit or you strengthen your flesh. I don't know about you, but I don't need my flesh to be any stronger than what it is. It's too strong. I thought I died. I'm going through dying again. Apparently, I'm going to live a life of dying. I mean, we're all dying, technically, but you ever think about that? It's kind of morbid. <laughs> like, I'm closer to death today than I was yesterday. Man, that's... To think about. But it's true. So, again, this issue of strong is really, really, really important. So, I'm not going to go through this story just for the sake of time, but in Genesis we see a story of Joseph. Joseph, how many of you know the story, had this dream. He didn't have the maturity to keep his mouth shut. So the Lord crushed him for several years in prison. Um, that didn't negate the truth of the dream. It came to pass, but not until his attitude was dealt with, his pride. But what happened was, you go through this. He goes through this crushing time, and, and his brothers did they did uh, was what they did to him wrong? Yes. Did he have right to hold it against them? Yes. But I encourage you, the story is in Genesis 37. Go back to that story and read through the end where Joseph meets his brothers again. And read it in the context, through the lens of forgiveness. It will give you a new perspective because that is one of the best examples in Scripture of what I call total forgiveness. Where he's gone through the journey, not just of externally saying, okay, God, don't hold it against them. But he has, he has truly, truly forgiven them. So let's, let's go to the next part, seven proofs of total forgiveness. This is where I would take notes. If this doesn't convict you, then I need prayer from you. Because you must be walking in something that I don't. This is, this is convicting. I thought I was forgiving, and then I was like, oh, man, it's not total. Okay, so the first proof of total forgiveness. This can be used as like a litmus test, okay? You don't tell anyone about it. We want to tell people what someone did to us. You're not over it if you've got to tell people. I'm going to keep these short. It doesn't take much explanation. The Lord can convict you in your own situations, but 
But I mean, just think about it. How many times you've been in a situation, yeah, I've forgiven this person, um, but you gotta make sure someone knows who it was and what they did, right? You gotta bring it up. That's not total forgiveness. You may be on the path to total forgiveness, but probably not total yet. Number two, don't let them be afraid of you. You don't want them to be afraid of you. Perfect love casts out fear. And we can use the story of Joseph. I mean, he was a ruler now. They came at kind of fear and trembling, a little afraid, not even knowing who he was, but just who his position was, a little afraid of kind of saying anything wrong. He could have done anything to them, and he didn't want them to be afraid of him. Why? Because he didn't want that, them to, to be punished with that fear, okay? Because again, that's just one more, we really want people to pay for it. We don't really want them off the hook, right? So that's just one more level. Number three, you want them to forgive themselves and not feel guilty. See a trend here? It's where we get to the point where we actually want what's good for them. This is that place where I was praying for this person and the Lord said, do you actually want me to bless them? No. Okay, then you haven't totally forgiven yet. And the Lord wasn't chiding me. He wasn't saying like, you haven't forgiven them. You think you're spiritual. He was just saying, you haven't gotten there yet. And that's the difference between conviction and condemnation. When we get Hopefully this is a convicting message, not a condemning message. Because con condemnation would say, look what you've done, look what you are doing, you're bad, you shouldn't be doing that. Conviction is totally different. It says, that's not who you are, this is who you are. It's pointing to the future, it's pointing to your purpose, it's pointing to your identity, it's pointing to where you need to be. Because Jesus sees us, in spite of where we are, he sees us where we're going. And he's just pointing where you're going out again. He's not wallowing in, look what you did. He's saying, this is better for you. So a lot of times when we get real conviction, we in turn bring condemnation on ourselves. So number three would be, we don't want that for them. We actually want to help them not feel guilt and shame and condemnation. Do we want what's best for that person? And really, that's what love is, right? Here's, here's a, I mean, this, this is really hard to swallow, but most of our unforgiveness comes from offenses that we shouldn't be offended about in the first place. I mean, there are real, legitimate wrongs that people do against us. You know, you get molested when you're a child, you get raped, you get abused by your father, someone steals from you. I mean, these are real wrong things. But most of the time, we need to forgive people because of just our own offense. It's the majority of the things that we deal with with other people are our issue, not theirs. The majority. And this going through this process is so helpful for changing your internal state to a place where you don't need to forgive all the time because you're not offended. We want to live lives where we're unoffendable. Blessed are those who are not offended in Him. We get offended very easily, and it ought not be so. Number four, you let them save face. You actually hide them and cover them and protect them from shame and embarrassment. So in a group, group setting, you would actually cover them. And if you go through this process with the Lord of total forgiveness, He will give you an opportunity to do each, each and every one of these. I guarantee it. Not just as a test to see where you're at with the ability to, to forgive, but as a uh, sometimes as a Encouragement for the Lord to say, you've totally forgiven me. And I've experienced too where 
a lot of we like to, things to be black and white. There's a lot of gray. We like to think, oh, I'm totally forgiven. See, I really want them to be blessed. I don't talk about it anymore. And then six months later, it comes up again. I thought it was over that. It's usually just getting at a deeper, it's like layers, just getting to a deeper layer. One more layer, one more layer. Number five, you protect them from their greatest fear. Again, it's that protection, that care for the other person. They're probably afraid, you know, if they did something legitimately terrible, they're probably afraid of people finding out, afraid of what people might think of them. And we have the authority in that situation to speak who they are, not who they were, or not what they did. Number six, you commit to a lifestyle of total forgiveness in every situation, not just the easy ones, not just the ones where we recognize, oh, this is just my offense, I need to get over it, but the ones where someone literally did something terrible. Can we let that go? Can we commit to a lifestyle? And number seven, you pray for them to be blessed. We pray for those that persecute us. We bless those that persecute us. We, we want good for those that wrong us. This is our witness. And when people witness you forgiving other people, sometimes these are public things. People, like a lot of people know what someone said or did to you. And you say, I don't hold that against them. Why not? You should. Look what they did to you. The world is going to try and justify and pull you in to justifying holding that offense, holding that unforgiveness. Because you have that opportunity to hold that and retain that. But I've also seen where people say, like, why did, why did you forgive them for that? How did you do that? Anytime someone asks you a question like that, what better opportunity than to get to introduce them to Jesus? Oh, well, let me tell you how. That's, uh, in evangelism, that's my, my favorite type of evangelism. I love doing, like, power or prophetic evangelism. Because you demonstrate the kingdom instead of trying to convince someone of the kingdom. And then when they experience it, that taste and see that he is good, they taste that and they say, what was that? Oh, well, since you asked, let me tell you. And so let me tell you about, well, I don't care what you say. I've been hurt by Christians. I, when, when we used to do ministry in Salem, there were the bullhorn guys. We'd have a tent set up and... A couple blocks down, there were the guys on the bullhorns with signs that say God hates homosexuals and God hates sin, and which the sin part is true. He does hate sin. Um, but they're spewing out hate. And they were causing people, I mean, the police were there so people didn't get killed. Um, you know, not love. And people, they would literally drive people down into our tents. And then we would just give away the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 4.20 is one of my favorite scriptures. For the kingdom of heaven does not consist of talk, but of power. And there's something to be said when you walk in something real and powerful, and people experience that, that they say, what was that? So much more effective than trying to convince someone. If you can convince someone into the kingdom, you can convince them out of the kingdom. You can't unconvince someone of something that they experience. Experience is more real than anything, than anything you could ever convince them of. And I'm telling you, when you live a lifestyle of total forgiveness, you release something tangible that people get to experience. People that walk with you, people that witnessed what happened, that is our witness. And it's super powerful. And on top of that, you get the added bonus of living a life free from anxiety and cancer and all these things that come from bitterness and unforgiveness that we hold in. 
as a bonus. It's good. So my challenge to you um, this week, take that seven proofs list and just pray through that, meditate through that this next week and just let the Lord speak to you whatever he wants. Maybe it's a specific situation that the Lord wants you to revisit and give to him. Maybe it's a specific one of those that you get convicted about. Whatever it is, just dialogue with him about that and take that to him. Because again, it, this is a huge... It's so easy to play the game of, yeah, but you don't know what they did. It's too easy to do that. We need to be above reproach. <laughs>